Hey guys, Jeff back here at the Backyard Oasis build. Uh, today we are going to be putting on the deck boards, but we have three things that we have to deal with first. We got our box beam, we got our carriage. We need to figure out the absolute size of the deck and finish installing the last row. We've also got to figure out how we're going to get our gas line run over to the location of the fire pit. And we've got to also deal with some planing issues because whenever you're working with wood, it's going to be a little bit, how should we say, not perfect every time. All right, and over here now. All right, above the coffee. There we go. There you go. Just set it straight down, flush. There you go. And we'll just mark that off. There you go. Why is that one so high? Hold on. Um, this is a 10, this is an eight. Okay, now we've got the frame finished. Let's jump into this planing. Got a few spots over there and one board over here. Every time you buy wood from the store, it doesn't mean it's gonna be exactly the right size. So be prepared with a planer whenever you're building a deck. One thing that we just don't want, dude, is we don't want anybody coming on and off this deck at the step and having things bouncy. Some people, especially when they get older, they get lose their uh, lose the strength in their step, right? So we're going to put on a hair gain strap just to hold everything nice and tight. And I'm going to put the screws on the piece that goes down on an angle. And this will just guarantee that it gives a nice pull on the downward force. There we go. Okay. Solid as a rock. That's the way I like it. So here on this channel, I like to show you my mistakes as well and how we fix them. And here's one simple one. Once we got all the wood out of the way, we realized that this beam wasn't level. That this back corner, was it was a little bit down. And that's just a result of starting in the middle, doing the left, doing the right side, having all the wood stored here on site. You know, you're tripping over yourself sometimes when you have no storage, right? So I wanted to show you this. I'm going from ridge beam to the second ridge here. You can see that I'm an inch short. And this isn't because of the wood's crowned. <laughs> Demonstrate it. This is actually a pretty straight piece of wood. I'm still an inch short. So because I'm an inch short, I'm going to use just a, a sliver off of one of my deck boards. I know already that because I'm going to use a nosing across the front, I'm going to have a bit of trimming to cut off here. Now having this problem actually gives us an opportunity to demonstrate what you do in the springtime. <laughs> After a few years, if you have an issue, let's take a look at here, landscape cloth. Okay. What we have here is a concrete post that has a one and a half inch gap. And so if we can lift this post, we can slide a shim in underneath. And so since we're an inch short, we're gonna add a one inch shim right here. And we're just gonna use a little bit of leverage. Because we have a box beam, anytime you can grab a two by four or a two by six if you need to, a couple of guys, Lift it up, have someone slide in the shim. No big deal. The worst thing that can happen is it'll fall back into place. <laughs> so you can you can grab your six-year-old to crawl underneath the deck and do that for you. All right. <laughs> this way, it's not as strong as that way. Okay, so cut your thickness that you want and slide your shim in with the grain facing up. Okay, you want this grain facing up, cut one inch thick this way. So because we're on ground, put a one by eight down, we're gonna go, oh, Get as much leverage as you can. That's good. Okay. And if you can just lift that for me. <clears throat> and up a little bit more. And a bit more. There we go. And boom. Loving it. Let's put that board back on and see how she looks. Ah. Uh oh. What do you mean, uh oh? Now we're low on this side. Really? Yep. Well, then we've got to do another shim. Cut another board. If we got the height of the deck wrong, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Let's start over here. I'm gonna add my joist tape. Now, if you missed this in the last video, just a quick reminder, the reason we're doing this is because we're going to go with like a picture frame front, which means I can have one board going along this way. So the finish is a beveled edge and a nosing effect. And then we'll tie in all the boards underneath it. 
because we're going to have the boards going this way, there's a propensity to trap water here. And we want to encourage a healthy, healthy, strong environment there because it is a bit of a safety issue for people walking on the deck. If the edge of the deck rots out, <laughs> let's just go long and tight. There we are. When you're gonna do the joist planing like this, if you're working as a team, remember, not everybody frames the same. So I know Matt likes to throw a nail from the top on an angle into the rim joist, we're going this way. So I gave him the marker. He's gonna walk around identify with a circle any nail head that needs to be sunk and he's going to put an x on the top of any of these that have to be planed it should just be a couple here most of them are over there so i know i got two here three here uh, maybe four okay here's what a planer is um i know this is on right now so i'll just keep my hands out of the way here's the blade right there kids okay good planer has two blades like this on the same wheel Watch how fast that spins. All right, do not let that come in contact with any part of your body. All right, the way the knob works is this. Zero right here, down in the bottom. And we have all kinds of adjustments. 164, like just minor stuff, right? Now, in most cases, 1 16th of an inch means 18 of what I'm gonna take off makes one inch. That still looks pretty non-aggressive. And for what we're doing, I'm gonna go in half of that, 1 32nd. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the high spot. And if it doesn't feel like it's very high, I'll just start about a six or eight inches out. Okay, notice the back here. That'll sit high on purpose. So you wanna start back, you roll forward, and then you wanna turn the trigger on, and then just push. It's still not flush. I'll go back another few inches. And that'll end up graduating that plane till it's nice and flush. That's all it is. Now this only takes a minute, but it's the difference between a great job and an okay job. Okay. Remember, we're painting for effect here, not for presentation. Stir the bottom in as you work, guys. Make sure you're getting the, all that goodness in there, okay? There's no such thing as putting on too much of this stuff. This little jar here probably will cut the end of three, four hundred boards. Okay, so you don't, it's not like you're going to run out. You want to put it nice and liberal on there. Let the wood soak it all up. Okay, here we go. Beautiful. Inevitably, somebody's gonna be like, oh my God, you're weakening your wood. Yeah, right, okay, I'm, so I'm taking an eighth of it off. The point is, is that this is a two by eight, and a two by eight floor joist can span 12 feet. We're only going eight feet box to box. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that I'm gonna have plenty of structural strength. This is one of the reasons why you don't wanna go undersize on your wood when you're building, because then you really do put yourself in a situation. Like if I use two by six, I'd have to have a beam every five feet. And then if I started doing this, man, that's gonna be dramatic, right? Because it's, it's not about I'm taking an eighth off, it's the percentage total of the thickness of that board that would be an issue oh and just a reminder the reason this is necessary is because it's a box beam which means i have two pieces of wood bolt on a post and they have their own different crown situation okay so meeting in the middle um, it is possible for one side of this board to be higher than the other and so when you're building just don't worry about it just keep moving forward come back this takes 10 minutes as we're right putting on our deck boards if we get to a point where the water is going to land right where everything is nailed together it's probably not a great idea because you don't want to have all of the ends of your fasteners exposed to all that rain. So if it's going to be a joint, I'm going to cover that in joist tape, just to give a little extra protection. This is the location I'm talking about. So if I have my two deck boards and they land right here, for instance, that means all those fasteners and where they enter and come out of the wood on both sides, it's exposed to extra water and I can't seal that. So if that happens, I'll throw a joist tape right down the middle. It's a water diversion system. The deck boards, might only last 50 years, but the, the frame itself probably will last 100 if you take good care of it. <laughs> That's the secret. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the plan for the deck. Here's the corner. That's me right here, okay? <laughs> this is the box beam, and here's our floor joist. 
what we're going to do is when we're finished putting all of our boards on, I'm going to have an inside table here. I'm going to build in a custom 8 foot sofa on each side. And then we're putting a fire pit right here. So my goal is to then now identify where this location is. Because I want to have my gas line come underneath the deck and come out of the deck right here. Generally speaking, when we do this, my gas guy, he's like, you need conduit. And so inch and a half ABS works great. Uh, try to find inch and a half ABS at the store right now. Maddening, so we want two. Spending more money than we need to, but it'll be easier to pull. And so if this is the whole deck, our gas comes off the house over here. So we're gonna run it, conduit, all the way to this location. We'll attach it to the frame using galvanized strapping and we'll put a line in it. But I gotta figure out this location. So my benches are 18 inches deep and that takes me to here. And then I wanna have at least two feet from the bench to the fire table. And even that seems a little bit close. We'll go 30 inches. Okay, so this is my 30 inches off of here. And I'm doing exactly the same thing over here. Bench space. So we'll go four feet. That'll be to the edge of the fire pit. Haha. -ha. But my fire pit is also a 32. So right there will be my measurement to the middle. So I'm going to 64 inches from both directions. This choice is going to come in real handy. So there's the middle. So what I'm going to do is bring my pipe underneath to here, throw an elbow on it. That way, when, when it's time, we'll be able to cut a small hole in this area. And then we can pull the soft copper pipe all the way through for the gas line, put a fitting on it, flare it, connect it with a flexible hose, drop the fire pit in position on a finished deck. And it won't be of any consequence because the pit is going to go from here to here. And so all the weight will rest on these joists. And this one will just be for show. <laughs> Okay, good to know the end from the beginning. Now I've got location. Just gonna glue together some pipe real quick, throw in a couple of fittings, run my string. That was the third thing I have to do. And then it's time to start decking. Can't wait today because we're gonna use the camel fastener system. I'm gonna show you how pretty it's gonna look. My design versus a traditional just straight board install. All right, let's get at it. Ah. All right, so I'm gonna tie a deck screw to the end of my string, just so I got some gravity working in my favor. I gotta go 12 feet. There it is. Got a coupling. And then I'm gonna have one more piece of pipe, but I gotta measure that off first. So let's take the total length of the deck, which was eight feet, 15, 15 feet. We'll finish the pipe underneath the edge here, because then I can put a skirt on and have the condo hidden. So it's 15, and then this is 64, 10, 7, 15 feet, 20 inches, 3 feet, 4 foot 8. 4 foot 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm going to cut it a little bit short because I'm going to use long sweeping elbows. Okay, let's get that on the string. Pipe, elbow, coupling. Okay. And just because I know my gas guy, when he's finished, he's gonna use silicone to seal it all up. So I bought a bushing so it doesn't have quite a, such a huge hole. So I'm gonna glue this together and feed it underneath the deck. Piece of cake, really. Now this does not have a requirement to be waterproof, per se. So I'm not gonna do adhesive on the fitting and the pipe. I just need this to hold up underneath the strength of running that line. Now, I'm not sure what it's like where y'all live, but where I'm from, as long as you have a gas technician running the line to this scenario, I don't need a permit. Just gotta follow the rules. Unfortunately for me, Brad, my gas guy, B-Rad, He's the one that did our gasoline for the fire pit at the farmhouse. If you're not familiar with our channel, yeah, renovated an entire 1880 farmhouse from top to bottom. And we put a fire feature in that one. Okay, here we go. 
he told me over the phone, just go run your ABS pipe. Gave me the depth because there was going in a patio. My understanding with this kind of thing is as long as a conduit is attached to the structure, there's no issues. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. When he gets back from vacation, we'll find out if we did this right. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel and follow along with the journey because I might have some egg on my face. I might, uh, might be crawling around underneath this deck later on. <laughs> Making some adjustments to my structure here, but uh, I like to have the end from the beginning, guys. You know that, but in this particular case, this is just a good educated guess. I'm not bothering him on vacation to find out. Okay, so before we glue this elbow, we're gonna slide this all the way along and see if we're feeling lucky. Ouch. What are they? There we go. Other side. I got a lot of wood here and I don't know why. I hate a messy job site. All right. Okay, so that's that's good here. If I was to turn it underneath, because I'm going to build a little two by four frame here, hang some square lattice off it, just so that the neighbor kid balls don't go running underneath. I don't need them crawling underneath my deck. Okay, let's go see how that turned out. Okay, so this is a good location. I'm going to show you one other trick to keep water from filling up that line while we're waiting for gas guy to come, and that is this. I'm just going to take a piece of joist tape and seal the end of that pipe. We can keep water out. Okay. Oh, I gotta get this to play ball now, don't I? I got lucky. Okay, right there. Beautiful. I'm um, also gonna throw a screw in the side of this joist and hang the string off of it. Here we go. Now, I've already got my screw. Problem solved, right there. So now we, it's not gonna fill up with water. It's in the right location. Screw's gonna make sure I don't lose that string. 64 inches out. I'm just gonna grab my camera, take a picture of this measurement so that I can remember later on to come 64 and 64 to drill that hole. Life is good. Every time you close that up, it gets almost impossible to open again. Okay. Make sure that my pipe there is facing up. There we go. Now, I can put this one on. Okay, here we go. Of course, it's got to be tighter than that. Give it a twist here, make sure everything's nice and glued up. And one more coupling over here. That's enough for now. I'm on the exposed side of the deck. So I got no problem coming back to finish this off once Brad's in town. <coughs> As you can see, just on the other side of the barbecue is the hook hookup for the barbecue. He's going to split that line so the barbecue can be, can be on top of the deck. And the other line can feed into here. And I'll wait for him to tell me what I need for requirements going back to the house. I might have to add another 2 by on the end of going all the way to the house. Maybe even on a post. I'm not sure. But I'll wait for him to tell me about that. In the meantime, let's get going on the decking boards. It's about time. There's a couple of things we want to go through real quick. Let's just take a look at Here's a here's a standard installation, nice and simple. If you make your deck 15 feet and eight inches long, you can go with a 16 foot board, have a little overhang, just install them straight, right across. And that's what that looks like. Uh, not terrible, but all of these end cuts are in the made in the factory, and they're not clean, and they'll stain a lot different than the surfaces, so it can be a problem. What I like to do is this way, add the nosing, which is why we built out this box out of the tape. Add the nosing, and then before we install all the boards, we're going to take our palm sander. We're actually going to round all these edges and clean this up as well. That makes all of this super sexy. And then I can set my nosing for the depth that I need. Now, in this case, for the purpose of the demonstration, I put it in a little deeper. But I am going to bring it out a little bit further. And I'm going to rip one of these boards in half and stick it underneath. And then from this point down, I'm going to add a lattice to close off the bottom. Okay, so we're going to intentionally install this a little bit deeper than we need so that we end result is something like this. Looks a lot like a stair. Then we can build a box step here and it'll be look real natural and that'll be it. So it's just a matter of getting a layout that you like, making sure that you install your boards like rainbows, not like happy faces. Take a look at the grains. This one would be officially upside down because that's a happy face. What happens here is this little knot in the middle, this piece ends up lifting out. It gets a little bit of water in there, and over time, you get slivers sticking out. So, these boards need to be flipped, okay? And we've got to identify, looking for rough surfaces that need a little palm sander work. 
This is uh, rainbow as well, rough surfaces. Probably a good idea because the place I go to buy my cedar, they always get the best stuff that's available in the country. There's a relationship with the owner and the mill. Even with that, you're still gonna get some edges like this, okay? The trees were cutting down, getting smaller and smaller every year. Try to incorporate some bench seating or make your deck a little bit shorter than what you need so you can cut off some of these rough edges. The worst case scenario, if you had to, absolutely, and you installed it this way, just, just realize <laughs> when you install it as a happy face, you are probably going to get cupping like this, like the happy face, okay? Remember, cedar is a softwood lumber. It likes to twist as it grows, and it has this natural tendency to want to warp. So it's going to cup like a happy face, or it's going to cup like this. It's going to get pronounced, okay? This gets rid of water. That holds water. And when you hold water like this, this little bit right here ends up sitting underwater for a long period of time. And if it's in the shade, it'll end up lifting. No amount of stain and sealing is going to protect you from that. Um, you probably have to do maintenance on it every single year, if that's the case. All right, so in order to set this nosing up, remember I'm going to take one of these five quarter boards. We have at least one of them here that's like a real hockey stick. And when you cut it down the middle, it creates a nice little one and two and a half inch piece. Um, but that's one inch thick. So I want a three quarter inch nosing, which means if I come off the edge of my deck here, because I'm going to be adding that bench seating, one and three quarters. I know it sounds aggressive right now, but right here is the perfect location, okay? And then I'll add that other piece after the fact. Now, I'm not a big fan of this. Generally speaking, I like to use um, the camo screws. I'll show you how that works in a minute, but it doesn't show any surface screws. But in this case, in this situation where I'm creating a nosing, I want to have a big head with downward pressure into the lumber, and I'm going to use a regular deck screw. Make sure you buy the brown. They make two colors. They make brown and green. In the old days, the green was for pressure treated lumber because it was treated with green stuff. And then we had brown for cedar. Now, even the pressure treated is brown. So if it's not a hidden fastener, make sure you're getting the right color screw because after the sun gets to it for a while, you don't want to have a bunch of little green dots all over your deck. <laughs> that would look kind of silly, wouldn't it? Um, we're gonna come back a few inches, three or four, one inch off the wood, four inches off here, in reverse. Burn that a little bit. And go perfectly flush. Or maybe just a touch of a dent. You don't want it holding too much water. At the end of the day, this is the weakest spot on the deck. So how this one board performs is crucially important. Now what you wanna do is you wanna go every 16 inches, okay? You wanna measure. Am I still at one and three quarters? Right? And in this case, I'm not. I'm way up. Okay? And you want to put that screw in every 16 inches. And you don't want to get a sliver. Okay? If you go too deep, the wood fibers will break off and then stick up in the air. And then people will be using your deck and their bare feet. Because people still do that. And they will get slivers. And they will get infected. And when they wake up the next morning, drunk on your floor, they're going to be like, oh, my foot hurts. What did you do to me? And it'll be all your fault because you didn't take the time to set the screws to the right depth. <laughs> okay, see that? Those fibers are dangerous. Okay. Now, the next step, of course, after you get your nosing set up properly, is to set up the camo screws. We use a separate bit. Make sure you buy the camo bit. Don't just try to find something in your toolbox that kind of works. It'll end up stripping. And the tool and the, the bit driver work together in harmony. Okay, so it's the, the kind of shaft and where the location for the finish is as well. Um, I'll just demonstrate that on real wood. Why not? Uh, here's the screws. They come in two different sizes. The short screw is French English. One and seven eighths. Okay, it goes off the, off the board like that around the corner, okay? And then it goes into the joist down here. And then when it's fully engaged, the screw will be down here like this, underneath the surface of the wood, okay? And you'll have one on each side, causing that pinching action to keep the boards from warping. It's actually a really efficient system because the downward force is the whole shaft of that screw. And it's designed so that it drills in here 
and the threads reverse here to pull that board tight to the joist, okay? So you don't get loose, slabby boards. It's amazing. Now, you don't need the real long ones. The real long ones are if you're using two by six lumber, because it's thicker wood. Short screws are fine, save your money. You're not getting any advantage buying the longer screw. All right, we've already identified all the boards and where we want to put them. This board has a nasty piece of damage here. Can't use this board unless I flip it. Ah, and the very end is damaged, but it's going under my benches. This will work fine. Got a couple of rough spots here I'm gonna clean up and I'm gonna definitely polish the end. All right. Now, that polished edge up against the next deck board with a small gap for expansion and contraction. Looks amazing. You get this bevel. It's the same bevel that's going to be on the rest of the boards. That way, I'll just show you how pretty that is compared to that. Which would you rather see on your deck? In order to get an excellent job, you're going to need a chalk line to start. First board we're going to put on that chalk line, we're going to manipulate it into position. We don't really care how the board feels about it. We're going to need a 2x4. Small section, okay? Because what we can do is we can throw a screw on that and we can use this to push and force the boards closed without causing damage to the wood. The wood of wood contact leaves a just really small amount of damage. Easy to sand out if you have a really stubborn board. Um, other than that, get your screws, get your camo gun and your palm sander and be, uh, be patient. This doesn't take forever, but it sure takes work. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw this bad boy on the inside edge and see if we have a straight line. That looks really good, eh? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna switch back to a couple of surface screws on the outside edge, and I'll tell you why. The camo screw, because it goes on an angle, every time there's a gap between the two boards, it'll pull or push, okay? Once you've got the first board in, it's easily manageable. Okay, so by going straight down on the end, I'm able to make sure that this board isn't going to be moving around on me. Minimal amount of surface screws. And I'm also going to have that corner table and then eight feet of bench here. So I'm only going to have two visible screws on this whole board. Now I'm going to have a straight surface that I can manipulate. That's awesome. And anywhere that I'm not going to have visible screws, I'm going to use a surface screw under the bench because the bench is going to provide us so much protection anyway. Against the UV, it'll never decay underneath that bench faster than it will in an open space. You're going to want to do at least your first row of screws on surface screw anyway. So start in the most um, non-visible location. In my case, because I'm having benches, this is the most non-visible location. This allows me to use all the bad wood and start with surface screwing. You'll see in a minute when we start putting those warp boards up against it, why having something straight to start with is so important. Now here comes the trick if you're working alone. You're gonna have your camel. Go out and get some of these empire squares, okay? The little eight inch or whatever they are. Six, seven, eight, six, seven inch. They have the same diameter or same thickness as the camo. So what you do is you start off over at your end. You start off by pulling the trigger and this gets wider. Okay, watch this. Okay, so it won't fit on the board. Now, and you release and it grabs the board. Okay, now automatically you set your space. So I can push it like that. All right, and I want to just leave a little bit of a hair, just enough so that it feels like there's a little bit of expansion space there. At the end of the day, it can expand all it wants out the other end. But I want this tight, and this is what I was talking about, having the surface screwed straight. Right now, because I have that, I can put that wedge there, and I can start by screwing on this end in this direction. So we'll pull the board in that direction against a board that's not going anywhere. You drop your screw in, you set your bit on there, and you just push while you screw until this ridge of the shaft hits the surface. That's it. Not going any further, okay? Now, that is what we call the surfaceless screw because it's on the side. You catch that okay? Yep. All right, now, if you're working alone and your board's not straight, 
as you can tell this one isn't right it's not bad for a little while you can throw a square over here pull the board open and if you grab a couple of them pull in there now you'll see the benefit a couple of these okay so i've got this to establish my gap and every few feet or so I'm gonna come along, hold that board shut, drop that screw, and allow that angle. If I want to make it tighter, I just lift the edge. I can lift the edge of the board. Just a touch. Pull out my square, and then finish driving it home. It's really that simple. It is really sloppy here. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing. When you're working alone, you don't have to have extra hands. You try to set your screw, it's sloppy, Lift the front edge, okay? As much as you want it to go this way, you lift it up here because it's a law of triangle. If I want to close an eighth of an inch, I got to lift it up an eighth of an inch. Now it's set in the wood. Get rid of that screw. Just watch it drive it home. And it pulls it tight. Problem solved. Once I got that gap consistent, and now it's also a straight board. Then I can come back on every board, okay? Like for instance, Right here where the gap is right. Now I can load both ends and just go back and fill in all the screws. The angle's always perfect. The location's always perfect. The shaft means you finish the right depth. Having that silver plate at the bottom and contact front and back means that everything is in the perfect location and both those screws will drive perfect every time. It's idiot proof decking, really. This is how you can make the nicest deck in the neighborhood. Now, of course, if you don't want it to be so difficult, you can leave a bigger gap. If you put it out and you start on this side, you're always pushing the board away a little bit. You're never going to get stuck. You're never going to get jammed in. It all depends on your personality. If you want to have it perfect or if you'd like to just get it done. <laughs> Both work. One more thing I'm going to show you and then we're just going to jump into time lapse. This is a really easy system for getting things done. You put a screw near the edge. Okay. And you can see that I need to close this gap up. And this is fantastic. If you don't have... Whoop, I got structure in the way. Let me fix that. If you don't have incredible amount of strength and you're looking for a way to get multiply your strength, here you go. Good old fashioned lever. You hold up to the top and this gives you the power of 10 men standing here pulling this close. You can do it with one finger. Okay? That's a lot of power to manipulate the wood. So much power that you can put the camo on, drop in my screws. I can just close that gap to where I like it. Drive it home.